there are these two topics, fish husbandry and animal health. Um, they can actually have standalone multi-day workshops unto themselves. We actually do a fish health management class, which lasts two or three days. So I'm going to squeeze all of that into a hour, 45 minute talk. Now, this is very streamlined, um, very basic, but I did want you guys to know that this is a, a pretty broad category or two broad categories, but I've made it sort of basic a little bit. Um, Everyone seems sort of excited about getting systems, right? A little apprehension, but everyone's excited, right? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, that's what I like to hear. No, not you, Katrina. I'm the, the teacher. <laughs> I'm excited. Okay. Excellent. Um, so I have, I'm heavily opinionated. So I have an opinion on what I think you guys should do, what you guys shouldn't do. Um, fish husbandry, right? It's cultivation of fish. That's it. It's just fish farming. All you got to do is you have to have a tank of water, you throw the fingerling in there. Nine months later, you have a full grown fish. Magic goes on in the water. You guys don't have to worry about anything. Is that cool? Yes. Yeah, that's not the way it is. So <laughs> I, I wish it was. I really do. But um, all right, first thing um, this whole talk is going to be based on tilapia. And, and not because I like tilapia, but I am going to be very biased towards you guys picking tilapia the first time. You guys do whatever fish you want to do, but I'll just like do one of these if you don't do tilapia and turn my back to you. No, I'm, it, it's not very aesthetically pleasing, but it's very tolerant and it's very forgiving. So when you have kids and you have first time people dealing with aquaculture, you don't want to try something super difficult. And I always get that. So I, you guys know I deal with schools a lot. That's not my primary clientele, by the way. My primary clientele is ornamental fish farmers within the state. Secondary is you guys that want to do aquaculture in your schools. Never fails. Hey, I want to start aquaculture. Um, I want to grow lionfish. <laughs> I kid you not. What's wrong with this picture? Number one, it's marine. I already told you, don't do salt water right off the bat. You can do salt water. It's not all that tricky. But don't do salt water right off the bat. Why would you do that? Number two, this is poisonous fish. I mean, you got kids. <laughs> And also ridiculously regulated. The amount of permits you need to do regulatory it. issues. And guess what? It's also never been bred in captivity. So why are you and, and on top of that, you're gonna, you know, I'm gonna teach seventh grade too. So <laughs> there's people that dedicate their life to, to focusing on lionfish. Why would you do something like that? Sloppy is easy, so easy you can just forget about it and go, like, oh yeah, we call it mindful neglect. Right? <laughs> oh, that's right. Do we have a tank of fish in the back? Who's going to feed them? We'll talk about feeding them in a second. Anyway, so this is your goal, right? You want to start with a fingerling. Hopefully, they'll look eerily similar to this. This is a blue Nile. Uh, this is a, so a blue Nile hybrid tilapia. That, that's mostly what's grown in the industry. So hopefully, you'll end up with this. Um, this is what it's going to look like. You're going to put it in your tank, and you're going to go. You're going to do this stuff. You're going to do the magic. You're going to end up with a, a, a big fish, and then maybe something like that. Right? If you do a fish fry if you want to harvest. Another good thing about tilapia too. Before I move on is um if you do it right and this is why i tell teachers start with tilapia because teachers like their summers off that's why a lot of you guys are teachers right summer's off like, what's that in the fall stock stingers uh, stock fingerlings eight to nine months later you got your filet you harvest all the fish you shut down the system you don't have to come in during the summer and eat fish if you want to do breeding or anything like that then you know you got year round you got to come in and feed these fish and you have to take care of them so I'll just drop that little piece of tidbit. All right. So what is fish husbandry? I have no questions. Okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. What's the question? Uh, I believe you guys set up in the pan handle. There was additional uh, requirements before you could get to off the side. That, right? that sounds about right. I think the line goes right on the east of Tallahassee or something like that. But yeah, I mean, it's Charlie and Katrina and Marcy can help you that. But it's, okay. it's, a, it's a piece of paper. Oh, so yeah. it's, it's no your, big for If your school is certified. Yeah. Yes. We get you certified. You can get a restricted species authorization for tilapia uh, for, the, for the specific restricted ones. No, no problem. Because you have a RAS system, it's containment requirements. Yeah. I don't. I don't know if the Zoom people heard that, but it's okay to have to have those types. Of, to have tilapia. Yeah. Get with that. I wouldn't worry. We can work with you on that. Don't let that stop you. Yeah. I mean, we got a school down in Cape Coral that does red crawl. 
And and that is one of those species where there's some stipulations to, to draw on the map and all sort of stuff. So, all right, but it, it's don't it's not a hurdle, it's just pay it. It's easy to pay. These are some of the things I'm going to talk about. This is by no means exhaustive to what you need to know at fish husbandry. If you've done agriculture of any sort, then you know what husbandry means. It's growing an animal, right? Um, I'm going to go over water quality. Not a whole bunch. Roy is going to give a water quality talk after lunch. And then Debbie and, and the rest of us are going to tell you how to use your water quality test kits after lunch. So it's all water quality after lunch, which is super important. Uh, and I'm going to go over some of these other things, but no reason, no reason to list them here because I'm going to talk about them. Um, water quality. I wrote monitor routinely on here before I knew that she was going to have you doing it every day, which is just, I'm going to laugh about that for weeks. Man. This is going to be so much fun. But anyway. At the beginning. At the beginning. Sorry. So some of these parameters, and we're going to learn about this a little bit long, a little bit after launch, right? But we want them to be zero. Total ammonia nitrogen versus ammonia. Nitrite. Uh, what else did I put there? CO2. We want these to be as close to zero as possible. The other ones like pH, alkalinity, hardness, we want them to fall into a range and it's all going to depend on what fish you're going to be growing. Right? This is another point. Tilapia, super forgetting. They have these awesome wide ranges of tolerance. Like you could even drop that DO down to like, what is that? Four, like three or four and you're still going to have them survive. Oh, so good. That's what you want, right? Blue chains, guess what happens? Something goes wrong. They have a little bit of ammonia in the tank. They lay on their side. All the kids are freaking out. Yeah, you don't want that. <laughs> Understand what your fish needs. That's super important to what you're going to be growing. You guys aren't going to be doing too much breeding, but some of these fish that we deal with, they like soft water during their breeding season. And so we'll hold them for years and years and go, why aren't they breeding? And then we'll soften the water and then start to get eggs. But now, don't worry too much about that because you guys are all going to be tilapia anyway, right? More water quality. I'm going to talk about stress a lot later on um because i'm feeling some of you guys a little bit stressed out but also no, I'm just kidding. But also um this is sort of the beginning of what we call disease and in, in fish health management and so that's going to be your first step uh when i go visit farms more times than not one of the first things that, that that i do is test water quality that's usually the problem uh i'm going to get phone calls from you guys or emails from you guys and you're going to go a fish are dying. I think they have some weird virus. They don't have some weird virus. It's probably something's going on with your water. Something's going on, going on with your management. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. I'm not going to go into too much detail about some of these opportunistic pathogens that tend to take a foothold when some of that water quality starts to go south. Um, this is all sort of interlinked. And usually what happens is this is what I call a cascading effect. Everything's sort of correlated. pH and alkalinity. Uh, hardness, these things all are, 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 are bound together. So when one thing tends to go one way, the other thing goes the other way, and you're like, what's wrong with my fish? Um, that's why water quality is important. So she's right. You should be monitoring it routinely uh, every day, it sounds like. At the right. beginning. At the beginning. <laughs> this is how I, I, just, I just do that until I get what I want. Um, <laughs> all right, so somebody was like, How many are you gonna tell me how many fish to put in my tank? And I was sitting there going, Haha, yes, I am, because I want you to, to succeed, right? Commercially, you guys are not commercial producers, you're schools, so basically, you're starting with your end tank. Commercially, we don't do that. We well, not we, I'm not a commercial producer either, but I do research, or I used to do research, I just do this now. Uh, we start with smaller tanks because we want to make use of our resources, right? So you have a little fish sometimes in this big old tank. That's not going to work. Uh, but that's okay for you guys. It's no problem. Uh, we're, 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 we're trying to get to some. I've never. Oh, maximum. It's not that great. Maximum <laughs> carrying capacity. That's, that's what we're interested in. So you guys are going to reach your maximum carrying capacity at the end. That's all you need to know. It's you want to reach that at the end because that's when you're going to harvest your fish or whatever you're gonna do with your fish. They're gonna reach that maximum size. When you stock them as little fingerlings, everything's great. Water quality is gonna be fine. You're not feeding all that much. It's fantastic. So even, you're gonna wait six to 10 weeks. And I'm not saying don't do that. Thank you. Right? Um, but you're not gonna put that much pressure on your biofilter because you're gonna stock them as fingerlings and they're gonna grow. It's gonna be fantastic. All right. What could happen if you understock? I, I, I'm going to give you a number. Don't worry. You, you, you're in a second. <laughs> I still like. It's like I want that number. I throw five in there. Like, no, I want that number. Like, that was very vague, Eric. Like, you didn't give me a number. I'm going to give you a number. Don't worry. All right, understocking again. I actually uh, 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 
suggest this for schools because you know it's not a contest. You guys are commercial producers. Um, if you do go way low, then you can cause aggression between some of these more dominant fish. Um, and then, of course, you're not using your resources wisely, right? You're, you're, you have all this big space that you're not using, but don't worry about that part because you guys are going to be understocking. And that's what we want. We want the fish to live. Overstocking. Uh, this is this could be a huge problem. You're gonna, I don't know if your system could take it. You're going to have all these fish in there. Like Courtney showed that 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 pond. Uh, commercial producers do this all the time. They like push the limit of how much they can get out of their fish within a small confine. Uh, increased agitation. Oh yeah, it can grow. It, it can stunt their growth too. Sometimes they'll, they'll get to this phase where they like, okay, you didn't feed them enough, or there's too many fish in there, and they they they, could, they grew small, and then they're not going to grow very fast after that either. It depends on the fish. Uh, but then there's that word again. Stress, increased agitation, increased numbers, increased stress. That's what we want to avoid, right? We do not want stressed out fish. We want happy fish. Happy fish are going to grow fast. All right, here you go. Sorry, I, don't, I forgot your name. I have not remembered any of your names. Barbara. <laughs> got it. Um, <laughs> totally convinced that you like. <laughs> got it, Barbara. All right, how many fish do I put in my tank? All right. So here we go. It's all about how much how much they weigh, how much food. You're like, blah, blah, blah. I don't care about that, Eric. Give me the number. All right. So for tilapia, interestingly enough, I chose tilapia for this, right? Um, and I went on the low side because, I, I mean, commercial production of tilapia can be quite high. So um, biomass density, a half a pound per gallon. Now, this is what we're going to end up at, right? Let's say your average harvest size is a pound. They can go, they can go higher than that, but let's just say a pound. Is it a quarter pound or a quarter pound? Oh, what'd I say? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Well, you know, what, what's written on here? I guess uh, I, just, I just speak. I don't know what I'm saying. You have a roughly 200 gallon tank. So we did the math on that, right? We did a little circle, quarter pound per gallon, uh, average harvest size tilapia. Remember, we're harvesting at the end. How many is that? 50. Who wants to be the cowboy and do 100? I knew you would. I, I did. <laughs> I mean, you would. You'd probably be fine. I, I honestly say that. And then, like like uh, Margie said, if something happens, it's my fault. And that's fine. Oh, um, you know, and I don't know if, if Courtney, you want to, Courtney and Charlie, you want to chime in on this either. I don't know. I try to keep them on the low end. <laughs> so let's, let's, let's go with 50. But so, sound good? How much does it cost per? All questions okay. need to be held till the end. No, I'm just kidding. No, what's that? <laughs> How much does it cost per fingerling? How much is it? Like, I don't even know. And we we were. Charlie, how much do you pay for our fingerling? We were a dollar when you buy. Dollar. 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 Yeah. About a dollar. So she just whispered to me that seems expensive. I agree, that seems kind of high. Uh, so um, to start with, it'd be about fifty dollars yeah. in tilapia. I think I think you could get them better than that. Better than yeah, I I usually get them well, for like four bucks scenario, or something like that. Right? Yeah. yeah. And, and what we're gonna do? So what we're gonna do is we're all gonna work together. And we're gonna get all of our fingerlings at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna buy them from a certain place because you're all gonna get tilapia. No, I'm just kidding. If you don't want to do tilapia, that's fine. <laughs> I understand that. If you don't want to do tilapia, I understand that. But if, if we mass order, we probably get a deal. Yeah. Um, what is the average survival rate for a fingerling up to maturity? I'm going to talk about that a little bit. 100 percent Okay. No, not at all. Um, some are going to die. And we're going to talk about that a little bit too when, when, when we get to like how I know my fish are sick. Um, some are going to die. But, but so if you start. With 60, you'll end up with 50. Not, not, not a lot of the sloppy. Yeah. Definition. Can you define what is bad culture? And why do you have 100 there? If you need 50, what is that? So, this is for the cowboy. So, because you are batch culturing instead so of you're starting with the same cohort, they're all growing up together. And basically, what, what I mean is you're going to end at that maximum carrying capacity. So, if you wanted to do 100, I mean, I don't. I don't, I'm suggested. I don't know if Courtney and Charlie want to be like, Eric, stop, Eric, stop, shut up right now. Um, because when you put 100 fingerlings in your tank, no problem. They're going to grow and grow and grow and grow oh, and grow. Okay. And so, so in the beginning, assuming, and, you're, you're and if you certain. manage your system correctly, the only time you're going to run into a problem is going to be right there at the end. You're going to be sort of pushing it. Going, oh, man, could I go more? Could I go more? Could I go more? 
Um, I don't, you know, I, are y'all okay with that, Charlie? Oh, yes. no. The only thing I'm thinking is if, if, if you did start with more you think of activities where you want to harvest and that oh. crop seed. Oh, yeah, there you, you go. go. Absolutely. Through, you know, just to make sure you That's a lot of fish 50. in the crop seed. No. So, but if you started with a hundred and you assume some some mortality and you want to do some necropsy at the end, you'll probably yeah. do somewhere between fifty and seventy, and I think that would be manageable. So, so let's let, let's keep in mind. I think we. I like that we're having a discussion about. Yeah, I think we said yesterday. Um, if if you're not as experienced with necropsy, you know, you might start small. Dip your toe in slowly. That's the, the pun, maybe. Um, so I'm I'm all for ambition. You want to make sure you're successful. Well, and another, another thing to think sure about. So I mean, say, you have a 200 I'm gallon tank, but you have almost 100 gallons of water elsewhere in the system, in, in your biofilter, in your solid, in your in your bed. So you have a little more as far as biofiltration is concerned. Um, so just, just a thought. Yeah. But I think yeah, the necropsy harvesting type of this guy, you're gonna have to stop this guy. Activity like, we do and, uh, what would be the biggest good. factor in enabling you to go ahead and be able to do the batch culture? Would it be the amount of uh, space, the efficiency of the filtration? Feeding. Feeding, feeding is the biggest because factor. this is gonna be the biggest problem for most schools. And this is why I'm, I'm getting into feeding, so you're my nice segue here. Um, did, everybody, did everybody hear that? So he's he asked me the question and the answer. He asked me what's going to be my biggest or what's going to be the biggest problem if you wanted to do more than 50 fish. And I mean, I called it the batch. You're all batch culturing because you're all starting with small ones and you're growing to, to the beginning. But the reason why I put batch culture there is the same because you could, your, your biofilter is not going to be stressed out right in the beginning. You're not throwing, you're not going to your max carrying capacity right away. Um, Eric, can you pause for a second? Feeding. Guys, this is really important. Like this entire presentation is going to make or break your entire project. Not to put no any pressure, pressure on you, Eric. Um, so please, please, please pay attention. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, all right. Um, <laughs> we're here. We have emails. We have phones. Yeah. And they ring and, and, and we, we receive. So matter. call and, and email. It's not that, you know, don't, don't get all stressed out. But he asked me what's going to be one of the biggest issues. And, and one of the biggest things that I see is feeding. And so a lot of times what happens is, yeah, why not? It's a couple slides away, but I'll just go ahead and mention it. Um, a problem with schools is, and I see this all the time, I'll go to a school for three hours and they'll get fed seven times in three hours. And I'm like, what the hell? Oh, what, what in the heck is going on? <laughs> and and they're because every time kids come in, that's the first thing they do. And I'm like, yeah, you can't do that because all that food's going down the bottom and just you're really stressing out your biofilter. So, so for you guys, that's going to be what you're going to have to limit a lot is the amount of times that your kids can feed. And I know, what else are you going to do with the fish, right? Well, now, <laughs> Katrina's giving you all these cool activities. Uh, uh, you know, there's some in teach aquaculture as well. So there's other stuff to do besides pet an animal. You can't pet a fish. I, mean, I guess it could. Uh, fairly problematic. But um, <laughs> Anyway, so I, feeding is probably for you guys is going to be one of the biggest concerns. Um, there are commercial diets available, so you don't have to really worry about this proximate composition, which is listed up here. We have that's I just pulled that off the label for sport fish or yeah, for large mouth bass. But um also lists proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, vitamins, and minerals. Every fish is different. But like I said, some of these things are commercially available. I highly suggest picking a fish that has a commercially available diet. That way you don't have to worry too much about it. It's already all that work's already done for you by somebody somewhere else. Uh, catfish, koi, tilapia, salmonids, you're not going to be doing salmonids. So, you know, tilapia again looks like a winner. All right, yeah. The, 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 the diet for fish, if you're going to do aquaponics, should be different because you want to make sure the nutrients that you provide are for the plants that you're trying to grow. So, we talked about that as well. Katrina, you want to? Talk? Oh, we can touch on that. So, depending on when you're growing in your system, and I'll talk about this more tomorrow as we go over the aquaponics bed and stuff like that, depending on what you're growing, your plants could need different nutrients. If you're growing leafy greens and stuff like that, you might have to add some stuff. Again, I'll touch base on this tomorrow, but if you have to add things, I'm not going to give you all the materials because I'm going to suggest that you grow things that you don't need to add things to your system to make it as easy as possible on you. The best one, uh, Laura said it in her presentation as well, 
basil. It is super heat tolerant. It grows really well in the systems without having to add anything. We just have tilapia feed that we put in our system. Boom, done. It gets all everything that it needs. Uh, once you start going into other things, obviously you're going to start need, you're going to need to do a little more research as to what you need. Yeah. Um, but you have to be really careful because if you just start throwing plant fertilizer in your aquaponic system, you're going to kill, you kill your fish. I, I literally went to a school. Star, star fruit is advanced. Yeah, don't yeah, don't try and be the uh, um, what is it the, the the Disney aquaponic system where they're growing like fruit trees yeah. and stuff like that. I, yeah. that. I, I went to a school and a dude was rooting oak trees in his aquaponics. <laughs> He's like, well, because they're all over my yard. I'm like, why is, is basil expensive? Is mint expensive? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Keep it simple. Keep your, it simple. See, your goal is not hurt. to be exotic and weird. Your goal is to teach, provide kids your information, right? You're teaching kids about aquaculture. So don't make things hard on yourself by picking lionfish and rooting live oaks in your, in your, <laughs> in your system. system. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, that's for that's line. for down the yeah. down the line when this project's over with. Yeah. So <laughs> our system is going to be outdoors. Mm -hmm. And we're going to fish in October. This is going to need to have a heater for like a tap water thing. Where are you at? Jacksonville. Yes. Yep. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that. So yeah, we're going to talk about that tomorrow. Orlando, a little bit Orlando, as well. we'll have that conversation. Yeah. So unfortunately, we it was an oversight on our part when we were purchasing materials, but that can be a um, okay. you purchase or we purchase. Well, them. and cash we'll is. Catfish are, are much more cold tolerant, so maybe that's a, a, another place you want yeah. to go with. And, and a lot, ton of information out there about how to grow. So yeah. probably a little less dense, but we'll not yeah, we can talk difficult. about it if you want to do some We're we're on or the yeah. heater thing, you know. All right, we're just getting questions at this point. Yeah. <laughs> what is the average yearly cost of a commercial diet for tilapia? Yeah. For an average 50 fish that you were I don't, it's not like a bag of food. I, I really have no clue what 50 bucks, maybe. Yeah, I think the like, how much is a bag you got? Like yeah. 50 pounds. 50 pounds will last you a long, a long time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's not, well, it's it's not, it's not gonna break. Less than $100 for a yeah, I, I, I know I'm horrible with price. No less I just forever. swipe this card. Well, when you need it, you need it. Yeah. Say that right. I wish you'd say that out loud. <laughs> All right, types of feeds. Pellets, flakes, just fine. Live feeds uh, as well. We tend to kind of forget about that, but those are super important. You guys aren't going to have to worry too much about that. Um, your pellet size is going to change as your fish grow. That's basically what you need to know there. I might, I might breeze through some of it. Okay, no, this is important. This is right off. That barbecue's coming there. Man. <laughs> All right. This is when this is when he shows up and it's like smell fills the. All right, fine. Okay. Um, anyway, all right, some nutrition stuff, real basic here. Um, and you know, whatever. So, how much do I feed my fish, right? Uh, a, a half to one percent of their body weight per day for five days. So, this was pulled off of something to just maintain the fish. You guys are going to push a little bit more than that. Uh, so, you're going to start higher. So, it's a percentage of per body weight. So, you're going to start higher as their fingerlings, and then it's going to get lower as you get. As you get uh, as as they grow, right? As you go on, so that's sort of uh, counterintuitive. It's actually going to be more food, so it's going to become more food because the fish get bigger. But you're you're feeding a percent of body weight uh, uh, per day, and so this may be actually what Charlie's talking about—a good idea. Maybe get some extra fish, pull them out, you know, weigh them. I don't know if you want to put them back. Maybe you want to do something else with them. But you know, so maybe some extra fish just to get that sort of like, how much are we should we be feeding? I always say this, as much as they'll eat in five minutes, but not 1,200 times a day, okay? <laughs> it, it blows me, and it's without fail, too, and your kids are going to want to do it, so you got to hide the food from them, and we'll talk about food storage as well. Uh, that's, that's all they, they're like, I oh, can't feed the fish, can I feed the fish? And next thing you know, it's just like a mess. Um, you've heard this term before, feed conversion ratio, fish are really good at converting how much feed that you've provided them into... Meat. Uh oh, Katrina has a question. That's an activity for the high school program. Perfect. Because um, I was going to say your your feed conversion ratios are probably going to be pretty high because of those kids. Oh, you're like, well, I used a bag of feed. <laughs> um, like, no. Can I? You said don't take them out and put them back in. Can we talk about doing that? Sure. Because if, sure. if we're going to do that feed conversion or conversion ratio activity, because uh, I want you guys to track that. 
we want to see how they're growing, how much food you're using, and stuff like that. That will also fall into the phase four about starting a business. They need to know how much feed they're using, why, blah, 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 blah. I mean, you can take them out for the back end. So. Okay. That's a good thing. It's a little, it's a little stressful. We'll talk about that. So, food storage, food use. Um, obviously, again, you guys don't have to worry about this too much. But the feed can become rancid. Uh, depends on the type of commercial feed that you use. If some of it's going to have a lot of fish meal, a lot of fish oil in it, some of it won't. Uh, but that, uh, if you just store it in, in outside in the heat in Florida, that's going to go bad pretty quickly. It's going to actually get fungus on it. So, stay within your expiration date. Store it in a cool, dry place. I actually, or we actually here at the lab, and I'm sure Courtney does the same thing. Most people I know do this. They freeze it. Do not put it in the refrigerator because it, it's a very humid, envi a humid, humid environment in the refrigerator. So it will get moldy faster in the, in the refrigerator. Uh, but if you can freeze it, freeze it. That's fine. Okay. And that'll, you can keep your food for a while in there. That is okay. All right, improper fish nutrition. Obviously, they're not going to grow very fast if you underfeed them. If you overfeed them, they're going to get some real big fatty deposits in there. Uh, you're, I would be like blown away if any of your fish are underfed. That would be amazing. <laughs> uh, so they're all going to be overfed. Um, and then you're going to have system issues too sometimes if you overfeed. We'll talk about, uh, well, I think Roy's going to talk about it a little bit, but if you overfeed, or maybe Courtney did, you're going to really be stressing your biofilter by just pushing all that ammonia. Into their into the biofilter all the time, and you're going to have to cycle. We'll talk about maintenance in a minute. Uh, but you do get some uh, abnormalities, deformities if you're feeding the wrong thing to the wrong fish, right? You know, koi or herbivores, uh, tilapia, the tribivores, uh, catfish. They all require a different uh, a dietary. Uh, they all have different dietary needs. That's why you're going to buy that commercial feed for the fish that you're growing. You're not going to feed uh, your catfish koi diet because that's not going to be good it's going to miss something it's not going to get a vitamin that it needs all right this is important uh because and again i geared this towards schools so i'm not saying that you guys are like every school but biosecurity and sanitation is super important um not only to prevent the spread of disease between your school and another school or between your farm and another farm but within your systems as well, now most of you are going to just to have the one system, but maybe you have a fish tank or something else going on. You want to be really careful about using the same equipment with those tanks and interchanging them around. Don't let Jimmy, uh, oh yeah, I'm going to talk about it in a minute. All right, never mind. Um, I haven't read this anymore. So, um, make sure your RAS systems components are functioning properly. I'm sure Courtney went over this, but this is super important for sanitation. Uh, this thing, so you guys are gonna actually get one of these. I don't know if you told them or not. Uh, that's awesome. And so this is gonna do mechanical filtration and biofiltration, but it needs to be backwashed. I'm gonna talk about that. So if you don't backwash it, it's not gonna be doing its mechanical filtration job. Oh, I thought you were that. So yeah, make sure all your uh, system components are are running routinely, so that they're working as well as they can. But that doesn't mean that you don't have to siphon your tanks. You're still gonna have to siphon your tanks. And me and Charlie talked about that yesterday. We're going to show you guys real quickly what that means. But so I was dealing with the school, and they and they were they got a, a, a bubble bee filter, and they're like, "Cool, we don't have to do anything." And then they started getting dead fish, and I was like, "Well, you know, help the tank." Like, well, there's a bunch of stuff on the bottom. I'm like, "Yeah." And so what happens is all that stuff, uh, poop and uneaten food, it's like a layer, and then it gets anaerobic underneath that and creates hydrogen sulfide, and then it burps. And when it burps, the fish is nearby; it'll actually kill the fish. It's very toxic. Yes. Exactly. Yeah, we're going to talk about siphoning the tank tomorrow. It's so easy. Um, and these are just some of the skills that we want you guys to know how to start a siphon. And, and this is something that kids can do instead of like feeding the fish 12 times a day. They can actually siphon the tank to get some of the stuff out there because this bubble bee filter is not going to do everything. Some of the stuff is going to stay in the tank. It's easy though. So easy. It's yeah. Um, and then also, you know, the water and airflow, you want to make sure that within the tank. Yeah, I don't know if that's what I want to say. About talk about anyway, um, you want to make sure that the associated equipment with your tank is always clean and don't share stuff. So if you have multiple systems, try to keep like if you have a net for one system, keep that net for that system. Don't take it over here to the other one and start digging around. 
uh, because some of the fish might be sick and now you're spreading diseases or, or pathogens between two systems. Um, Bircon, chlorine, 70% isopropyl. Make sure the kids wash their hands. Yeah, good luck with that one. Uh, easy, 70% isopropyl spray bottle right by the tank. This is easy. And they'll probably love that. And then just wipe it down. That's easy. You know, if they, they maybe they have a fish tank at home and they were playing with their beta before they came to school and their beta is carrying dick or something. And then they start dipping. And this, this has happened, like, oh man, so much. I, can't, I went to a school one time and they're like, yeah, I had some fish in my crib and I brought them into the tank. You know, three weeks later, they're all dead because they had it. So um, yeah, just be careful about transferring between different systems. A lot of people don't think about that, particularly schools because you're teaching and other teachers have fish tanks. So just be cognizant of that. Thanks, Jim. So let's see you have the three different tanks in the same system, the same operation. Yes. Is it you know, it's answered by three separate. Um, no. So his question was, if you have three different tanks, but they're on the same system, is it necessary to buy different equipment? Absolutely not. If they're if they're sharing a sump, if they're sharing a pathway of water, if, if, if one of them's sick, they're all sick. So mm -hmm. there's no reason to really separate them at that point in time. For you guys, it's more about, and I, and I see this a lot, kids that have aquariums at home, or you yourself have another aquarium, or another teacher has another aquarium, and then transferring whatever's in that aquarium to your system tends to be problematic. Um, limit traffic, limit outside contaminants. I've kind of talked about all this stuff before. Some of this stuff might be overkill for you guys, but um, net dips, especially if you have other systems that we use, Vercon, that's probably a little bit expensive. You could use chlorine in your net dip. Um, this is Mr. David Boozer. I'm going to go ahead and introduce you. Middle of my talk, man. This is Mr. David Boozer. He's providing lunch for us today. Uh, he's, he's, Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me wrap up. All right, we're done. Any questions? <laughs> uh, but he's the executive director for the Florida Tropical Fish Farms Association. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. But anyway, let, let me finish up here. Uh, some foot baths, some net dips. Uh, these are just to keep your equipment and, and the transfer of things between systems and between other farms or schools. Uh, down to a minimum. All right, so I talked a little bit about water and air movement. And this is why I, I passed over it. Uh, so we really don't think too much about this. Um, actually, oh man, I gotta hurry. Um, the water moving into your tank and the water moving and the air moving into your tank is actually really important. You kind of don't think about it too much, right? It's just like going in and going out. Um, this can cause stress to the fish. Uh, well, number one, you, got, you want to make sure your system is working uh, good. So here's one of those burial balls. You guys have circular tanks, a little bit better, uh, but the water inlet is at the back. I've seen one where they're right beside the drain. So this, this is the drain. Like, so the water's coming in and then it's draining. Like, what's going on with all this water in the back, right? It's not mixing very well. Just be aware that where the water's going in and where the water's leaving, you want that to be a pretty homogenous environment. Um, if it's too much splashing or too much uh, turbulence going on from the air or the water, this could cause stress for your fish, right? So we've talked, mentioned that stress, that fish stress a lot. Um, so and, and it's, and some of this depends too. Like you may want to alter it for production phase, but again, you guys are just doing grow out, what we call grow out. Um, so you don't have to worry too much about breeding or any of that kind of stuff. Oh man, here it comes. All right, we're done. Let's eat. No. All right, let's get it. All right, so fish stress. This is important, and this is sort of the segue to disease, but I'm really just touching on it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later. Uh, fish stress. Fish is unable to maintain a normal physiological state because of various factors adversely affecting its well-being. A bunch of fancy words that just mean your fish are not within their normal habitat, right? I mean, you guys are stressed out, right? Coming down. I mean, you're not at home. Well, some of you go home and go to sleep, but I mean, a lot of you are in the hotel. That's not very much fun. You're a little bit stressed out because you're here. You're not in your really prime environment. Think about that. If abuse is going on at home or something bad is going on at home. You're not happy. You're not in an environment where you can thrive. And that's really what you want to think about for your fish. So you have this tub here. And if everything's not perfect and all, they're all going to die. Well, I mean, that's not necessarily true, but you want it to be as optimal as possible. You want to be able to be considerate about their habitat, right? Because that's the best way to put it. Oh, so what can cause fish stress, right? Well, being in a blender can cause fish stress for sure. Um, 
That's <laughs> bassomatic, right? For those of you that are my age. Um, anyway, um, chemical things, I mean, water quality is all balanced, right? Diet is wrong. You can cause stress. Not eating the right thing. I just found a hermit crab the other day. I was trying to take care of it. I had no idea you know, what was it takes to take care of a hermit crab. Like, man, these guys are hippie. Um, or maybe it's just me. Maybe not. Uh, biological, we talked about overcrowding, aggression, other organisms. These, these don't have to be uh, other pathogens or some sort of virulent virus. This could just be other fish, something else in the tank that's causing them stress. We see this a lot. Fish are very territorial, especially in low densities. They tend to be very territorial. Uh, physical things, sound, light, temperature. Here's Jimmy. This is my prototypical kid coming. Katrina. Yeah, Katrina comes into your, into your sorry, I was going to be Jimmy, but now it's going to be Katrina. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> she comes in and likes kicking the tank all the time, right? And, and, and coming down there with a net or a brush or trying to catch the fish. This is stressful for the fish. This is not good, right? Uh, we talked about uh, handling. This is one thing we're talking about taking the fish out, measuring them, and putting them back. This causes them stress. Stress is the precursor to disease. Not all the time, but it could be. And you want to be aware of that. Um, this, uh, are you going to talk about uh, diseases later on? Or not? I'm going to, so this, we, Roy is going to give a water quality talk. And we talked a little bit about like diseases. I'm going to, I'm going to breeze over it very quickly um, because we do a three-day workshop on it. So it's very hard to get in, yeah. in depth. There are lots of materials shared in the classroom about disease. There will be an activity about disease identification. Did you do the nine pictorial guides? Are they in the book? Or are they Where, I, I'm not. I'm going to narrow that down. Okay. Um, into that. Uh, yeah, because nine pictorial guides is a lot. I get it. Um, but yeah, those materials will be available. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so the answer is. Not for this talk, we're not going to go over it all that much, but she does have some stuff available in the binder. It is a huge topic. I mean, yeah. it's not a matter of if they're going to get sick. It's a matter of when. They will get sick. We would have Hopefully not have... in the year that this project takes a foothold. Yeah, we would have loved to have Roy to talk about it. It's just we did not have time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we went back and forth about it. Roy's yeah. actually a little upset, but I mean, we, there's not really too much we could do about it. Um, Here's some of the things that happen when your fish are sick. They stop eating. That, that's pretty noticeable. And what happens too is, you know, Katrina keeps feeding the tank, even though the fish aren't eating, because she doesn't care. And she's just like, whatever. And, and then your system is all out of whack because you have all this food on the bottom and you're trying to tell Katrina not to do it. And then she still does it behind her back. It's weird. But anyway, um, appear or act lethargic. And I, I love this because you guys are like, what does that mean? You, you guys, if you haven't had fish before, you're going to be amazed after three months. You're, you're going to be like, you're going to come in and you're going to say, oh, my system sounds wrong. Something's, something's wrong. My fish are swimming wrong. I, I don't know what's happening, but something's wrong. And you'll just be able to tell what that means because if they, if they appear act lethargic, they're just, you're kind of just like, something's not right. You just keep an eye on them, right? Abnormal swimming. Scraping up against items, that's usually a sign of a parasite. Something that's funky, something that's out of order. And you just have to trust me on this. This will happen. You, after three months of having a fish, you're going to be like, oh, my God, I can't believe. It's like puzzle eye. Like, you're just like something that that one's not swimming right. Beatrice isn't swimming right. Uh, gasping at the surface. Uh, this is typically a sign of low DO, a low dissolved oxygen. Uh, but also, uh, tilapia tend to do this when they're eating, too. So don't be alarmed if you come in and they're all like that. And you're like, oh, my God, my, my oxygen is out of whack. And that's not, you know, it all depends on the fish a little bit, too. They, I will say the tilapia in our system back there, they, like, see our shadow coming. And they yeah. sort of, oh, oh, I have two oh, in oh, tanks oh. in my office right now, yeah. like smaller guys. Don't ever see this. Yeah. Um, I already said rubbing up against stuff, uh, uh, they start to get sore. They actually start to get sore. Now, this is stuff that's more uh, expressive, right? And this guy has, you can see all the white, this loach has it, all the white, the sort of dusty appearance on him, right? It ragged fins now. Um, the abnormal body shape, I'll show you the guy that had lordiosis, his spine was all deformed, right? I mean, these things are going to happen. So, you know, dead or dying fish, I put this on here because, you know, he asked me about these guys, well, is dead fish bad? And, and it seems sort of like, are my, are my fish sick? Well, if you had a dead fish, I mean, that's yeah. <laughs> beyond sick at that point, I guess. It's, uh, <laughs> it's beyond sick. But, but I think you might be sick. 
Hold on. So what I mean by that is um, think about your fish as a population, right? And so when you get your fish, you're going to get your 75 fish and you're going to put them in the tank. And, you know, one or two are going to die. That's going to happen. It, it, and it's okay. You're talking, you're thinking about it as a population. Roger the fish died. You guys can have a funeral, whatever you want to do. That's fine. Um, a couple of weeks later, another one dies. And now you're like, oh, all right. Okay. And this just happened to me, by the way. I, I got some fish from a farmer because we're working on a, a breeding uh, some, some Panamanian cichlids. <laughs> and one died. Right off the bat, no big deal. Another two weeks later, another one died. I'm like, hmm, store that in my head. And then three weeks, and then two, two more weeks later, a third one died. All right, hold on a second. Now it's time to have to get them looked at. Sure enough, they had a mycobacterium, which is bad, uh, and we had to uh, deal with that situation. So that's kind of what I mean about that. I don't mean singular fish, I mean the group of fish, right? And so they're going to die from time to time. Things are going to go wrong. It's when you start to see this. You're either going to all die at once or they're going to die one at a time. And if it continues, then you need to go, oh, something's wrong. What should I do? Oh, no. I have this, this awesome, awesome diagram. This was uh, Dr. Ruth Francis Floyd is on our mentoring committee. A great lady. Uh, if you ever had a chance to meet her and talk to her, she's fantastic. But anyway, um, th this is not a, a, a perfect scenario. Or I guess it is a perfect scenario. But this is not always what, what happens. So here you have your fish, right? The host. Right? And then here you have your fish tank and everything's all hunky dory and, and sometimes you even have this pathogen living in there and that's fine. It's okay. Some of these are what we call opportunistic pathogens. They're just in the water. Or Katrina wants to measure fish. Oh gosh. So she goes over, she, for whatever reason, turns off or she's like, oh, I don't, I'll just turn this valve off. It turns off the, the valve to the biofilter. Right. I don't know why you would do that. She's, she's mean, in seventh grade. I'm a little so, uh, just But you don't know about it. And then your water quality gets all out of whack, right? Your ammonia goes up. And then suddenly the host is like, oh man, this is not comfortable for me. And the pathogen is like, oh yeah, here we go. And then you end up in this zone here, right? And the other thing that happens is now Katrina's, okay, so now everything's functioning correctly again, right? Wonderful. Um, <laughs> She measures the fish. She wants to take the fish out and measure it. And she lets it sit for a long time. Out in the air, she's like hitting it with a screwdriver. Like, oh my God. I know, right? What the heck? What's wrong with her? Man? Now it's got these scrapes all over it. The environment's fine. The host is stressed out. The pathogen's like, here we go. End up in this little area here. You don't have to have something always be wrong with all of them to start to express some sort of a, a problem. I've had systems before where we know there's a, a pathogen in there. And as long as we keep everything else beautiful and hunky-dory, no problems. But if something goes a little wacky, I had to add that. I was just going to go with hunky-dory, but I had to add that little thing. All right, types of diseases. Types of diseases. Uh, yeah, really, quick, quick, quick. Uh, Non-infectious. So this is kind of stuff we've already talked about. Um, and these are stuff you really don't think about too much. But nine times out of ten, this is what's going on. Not the genetic stuff. Not so much nutritional. Sometimes it is. For me, it's always water quality. When I go to a farm, like I said, I deal with farmers all the time. When I go to a farm, like, Aaron, all oh, my fish are dying. I, I must have a funky virus or something. It's always a virus. I don't know where that started. <laughs> but it's always a virus. And I'll, I'll test the water quality and sure enough, it'll be your ammonia is high, you have some nitrite, your CO2 is high because we have a problem with the, the, our farms around here. Um, <clears throat> something is out of whack with either the water quality or the root stock management. You know, oh, one of my guys turned the valve off. Well, I mean, you know, let's think that might be the problem instead of now you have this strange fish virus, which is incurable. So, um, yeah, a lot of times it is some of these, right? We try to check these boxes first as we deal with something like, oh, now my fish are sick. Let's check these boxes first before we move on to infectious diseases, which are always, you know, like this is the sexy stuff. This is awesome, right? These are like critters that are attacking critters from outer space that have come <laughs> and are killing my fish, right? So uh, we got parasites. Parasites are awesome. Uh, we do have a, a nine pictorial guides about different types of parasites and funguses. Uh, which I highly recommend if you are 
you know, up late and want to read some cool stuff about uh, weird, pictures. weird pictures, which will, uh, uh, yeah, this stuff up close, this diary back was up close, it's fantastic. But anyway, um, a lot, uh, they're both internal and external. Um, a lot of times these are sort of the opportunistic stuff. So, so some of the bacterial things that, that happen. A little harder to diagnose the bacterial ones uh, because they don't have this great sort of body form that, that, that we see uh, either on our fish or through a microscope. <clears throat> Um, often for, for you guys, you probably start to exhibit as sores or ragged fins or things like that. Yeah. If we notice any of the fish do have like a sore or something developing, should we pull it out of the tank as soon as possible? If Will you it spread? If you are Eric, then yes. So I, I eliminate it, but, but more than likely, it's probably already in there and you probably should treat anyway. Um, and we've kind of talked about this, like me and Roy talked about this, like how. How are we doing? Like, what sort of network should these guys, the teachers, uh, reach out to when they have a problem? Like, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about that because there's really no answer. They're like, I'm leaving you guys out to, to dry. No, get a hold of me. And, and I'll, I'll get to my end here in a second. Uh, viruses, funguses, the viral, there's no really specific medication. We're still learning a lot about viruses. Um, I, I would be really surprised if you guys had a virus within the first year of um, fish. You may end up with something along these lines, but uh, uh, again, I, I'm more concerned, and that's why we're dedicating a whole half day to water quality. And if you manage your system correctly and you manage your water quality correctly, you guys are going to succeed. Don't be scared by this. <laughs> What do I do if my fish are sick? So it's like, I mean, you should just be like segueing all my slides. <laughs> I know, right? We must be on the same wavelength. Yeah. I was born on that day. I don't know if you Okay, so get a diagnosis, don't guess. That's totally counterintuitive to how we're going to approach this, right? So um, guessing is really bad. And this happens all the time because uh, sometimes the treatment does more bad than, than it does good. Some of these treatments are different. So before you do anything, because you, it, you're gonna be limited in your ability to go to a vet, we do have, um, uh, you know, kind of glossing over this a little bit. I'm gonna, I'm gonna click to the next one. So we do have a website uh, where you can look up fish vets if something does happen. Um, Roy is a veterinarian, but we're still trying to work out the logistics of actually you guys sending us fish to be looked at, because if you have 50 of them, we're going to want like five of those to look at. So that may not be the, the, the route we want to go. It may be, am I, am I being recorded? Yeah. All right, I'll just say, say it. it. Yeah, um, no, that's okay. It may be a situation where you want to get a hold of me and, and send us pictures and send us things like that so that we can give you an educated guess or maybe look at a fish or something along those lines. Um, we're not going to leave you high and dry, but I don't want you to think that this is going to happen uh, 10 times out of 10 because it's not. If, again, I'm going to reiterate it. If your system is running correctly, and oh, what else is it? Water quality. Water quality that's right. <laughs> Somebody's paying attention. I forgot. I was like, I'm, I'm just like, let's barbecue. No, 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 no system's running correctly, water quality, you guys are going to be okay. All right. But this does exist. I'm going to leave this up here because I think that's my last slide anyway. So, um, questions? Yeah. I had to do the scary part where I had to talk about like this is even this is scary stuff. So, yeah. Are there any proper product protocols that we need for disposing of dead fish or a fitness? Fantastic question. Can we put them in a garden? Yes. I would talk to you. That comes back to what was brought up yesterday about if that produce is going into your school cafeteria, um, there might be the restrictions on that. So yeah, I think like Katrina said, talk to your schools, talk to your administration, talk to if you have like a garden coordinator, talk to, so, and if, again, if there are still questions and you wanna talk about it, reach out to us. Yeah, and I'll use this. And our so nutrition and wellness folks too, again, who couldn't be here, they wanted to be here at this training, but they have a lot of experience with school, school gardens and the farm to school program. Um, we can always move them into conversation. Yeah, and I'll use this kind of as an opportunity to talk about that program. So they are like, so food nutrition and wellness, you can get your like garden certification that I talked about yesterday. 
but all of that comes down to it is very local specific. So you need to talk about your admin because I mean, who runs your cafeteria and like the food safety and stuff like that is very district specific. Like it's crazy the regulations on that are really, really specific. And those are the type of things that will dictate whether you can put, you know, your animal waste in your garden and stuff like that. 